I know we, we needed it. And just thinking about that, sometimes we forget to go back and give thanks to God for what he's really done. Even our own personal lives, where he's brought us from, where he's taken us. I think that scares us more than anything, what God's wanting us to do or what he has planned for us to do. So um, he's an awesome God. He's a God that cares for every need, and he's a God of hope. We've been talking about, first we started out with nations that uh, are righteous and how God upholds them. And um, we've been talking about the end times and things that are coming to pass in our life that we've got to see. And Jerusalem becoming, or yeah, Jerusalem is the, what do you call it? Now, we put our embassy there, you know, and Israel become a nation and the Six Day War, and all those things that had, uh, um, God has brought to pass, prophecies that had to come to pass. And uh, we've talked about the rapture. We've talked about it's our job to take the word of God to people, to let them know, and so that their blood isn't on us. It's our job to go to them in love and show them what sin is. And as we look to our nation now, We've taken God out of everything, and that seems to be the pattern that wants to happen. But God is in control, and God causes things to happen that we could never imagine happening. So as we go into this today, we're going to talk about the up things now. What God has, has for us in store for us. The new Jerusalem, a new beginning. And all the things that are going to be new in our lives. And you know, we see that as we become Christians. We see that happen. We had a testimony from Jamie last week of how God has changed her life and made a difference in her life. And we all have what ought to have our own testimony so that we can share it with people that they know that God's alive today in my life and what he's done for me and for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this time that we can look into your word. Father, the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. Even, Father, if the wrath comes on our nation, nations around the world, Father, plagues, whatever it might be, Father, you've called us your blessing because we know Jesus Christ. We all fall short of the glory of God, but Father, it's only through Jesus Christ and his righteousness that we can stand. And, Father, that we can believe and hope in these times. So, Father, encourage us in your word today. Father, show us things that we haven't seen before. And, Father, we just pray that uh, you would lead and guide us by your Holy Spirit. And Father, we're just not here to listen, but Father, we're here to learn and to know more about you and to gather information, Father, that it will change our lives. And so, Father, give us ears to hear and hearts to receive, and we ask it in Jesus' name. If you'll open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 20. <clears throat> There's going to be a thousand year reign. Jesus is going to come back and there's going to be a thousand year reign. A millennial they call it. And they're going to come and he's going to reign here on earth for a thousand years. Okay? He's going to, he's going to get the devil and he's going to throw him in the pit and lock him up for a while so that he cannot deceive the nations. Do you know there's a lot of deception going on? Even now. Um, even pointing that it's not sin anymore. It's a lifestyle, no matter what it is. And so that's a deception. What did Adam and Eve, what did, what did the devil do to Eve? Will you surely die? He tried to get her to question the word of God. 
And now that things have turned around, even some churches are allowing things that's sinful and saying it's okay. And it's not that we should ostracize ourselves from, from people that are sinful because Jesus never did that. He was always one among them to help them, to strengthen them. And, and he went into their life to make a difference. And that's what you and I are called to do, to take the word of God to the people that have been deceived. And the Bible says in Zechariah, right or be wrong and wrong will be right. And that's where we are today. Everything's okay. It's not. It's not okay. God's wrath is going to come. Judgment is going to fall. Why? Because of wickedness. And that's the bottom line. So where do we need to be in all this? I want to start with verse 7. Because God is going to lock the, the, Jesus is going to lock the devil up for a thousand years. And then he's going to turn him loose one more time. And the, the thing of, a, of the devil is to deceive. And so deception is believing that right is wrong and wrong is right. And that's what the devil comes to do in our life is deceive us into believing that wrong is right. It's not a sin. And that's not what God stands for. And the wrath comes upon people because of that. And we're not held to God's wrath if we know Jesus Christ. Okay? Verse 7. And when the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth. Magog, Gog and Magog to gather them for battle. What's he going to gather them in battle for? To fight against right and wrong. Understand one thing. All the enemy does is deceive. He's a liar. And when he's telling you you're no good, never will be any good, he's a liar. you got to believe what God says about you. But it just impresses me that both times when, when, Jesus, or when Jesus bound him up and threw him in the in the abyss and said you're not going to be able to deceive the nations anymore how would that be even in individual lives how would that be in our lives what is the lie that the devil keeps telling you about you that you'll never amount to anything you've never done anything good and he is the accuser of the brethren. Who's the brethren? We are. Jesus' people. We're the brethren. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's the whole key that the devil wants to do, is to get you to doubt the word of God and to believe a lie that sin isn't sin. It'll be okay. But it's not. Because wrath always comes because of wickedness. When, when, when Noah built the ark, there was wickedness, great wickedness. When Lot was saved, great wickedness. And Abraham, Abram, he keeps trying to, he goes to God and says, well, if I can find 50 righteous people, will you destroy? No. It gets clear down to 10, I think it was. <coughs> but the bottom line is, God saved Lot and his family out of that. But his wife, what? She looked back and they said, do not look back. And you know, that's pretty good advice because don't look back at your past. Because you can't change it now. You can only change the future and where God wants you to be in your life. So the deception. And I've often wondered why would God. He's got him bound. He couldn't do nothing. Why did he let him loose one more time? I don't know that total answer. Other than to see if his people will believe. 
and that God has a way that righteous judgment has to come. And because of that, God has to judge and bring judgment on people to show to his righteous people, the ones that believe in Jesus, to show them that he is true and he is faithful to his word. And he will judge those that are wicked. And so that's what God has to do. How many of you have ever had to punish your kids? And I never, and my dad says, this is going to hurt you more than it's going to hurt me. I said, Dad, you don't know what you're talking about. When you got a whooping, you know, I didn't see any pain on his face. But emotionally sometimes, the sadness of that. And just think how God feels, his own creation that he's made He's, he's brought them up. He's given them freedoms beyond freedoms. And yet they don't want to follow him. They don't want to do what he says. And we punish our children because we want them to do right. And to know the difference between right and wrong. Verse 8. And we'll go out and deceive Satan. We'll be released. Back up just a little bit. We'll be released from his prison and we'll go out to be de to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth. Gog and Magog to gather them for battle. In <clears throat> number, in number they are like sand on a seashore. They will march against the breath and the earth against and earth and surround the camp of God's people. The city he loves. What's the city he loves? Jerusalem. That's the city he put. <clears throat> but fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prop prophet have been thrown. They will be tormented day and night for ever and ever. You know, we think this 75 years or whatever we live, 80, 90, 100, we think we go through some hard times and it seems to be torment sometimes. Have you ever had that in your life? It's just like, God, what did I do wrong? Nothing seems to go right in my life. But you know something? If you're going to be there forever and ever, eternity in torment, the devil gets exactly what he dished out. He tormented people. He tried to make you see that, think that love, God's love was conditional. And it's not conditional. It's conditional to the point that if you believe in him and you trust in him and you've turned your life over to him, you're saved. But sometimes when we have love for somebody... It's not unconditional. Because we love them until they do us wrong. And that's not how God is. He gives us chance. We talked about patience last week. He gives us opportunity to change our lives. And to make a difference in our lives. They'll be there forever and ever, night and day, being tormented for eternity. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, that's where you're headed. But if you know him and you've asked him to come into your heart and you've accepted him because he, took the, he was the atonement for your sin, then we're not appointed to wrath. God's judgment. And that's why he turned the devil loose. Because what's going to happen? Fire came down. We talked about it last week. Fire come down and it melted their eyeballs out and rotted them and their tongue before they even hit the ground. God promised he would not destroy this earth with water again. We have the rainbow. We talked about that last week. But the next time is fire. Because fire burns up all the chaff and all the unnecessary stuff that there is. And if your life was to go through fire right now, what would be left? If your home, everything, what would be left? 
hopefully the hope of Christ. Because this is just a shadow of things to come that Jesus has for us. Because in John, he said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come back and get you. And I want you to be where I am. That's a promise for God. And sometimes we need to know that over and over and hear that over and over to encourage us in the things of God. Verse 11, and then I saw a great white throne and said, <clears throat> him who was seated on it, the earth and sky fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up its dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in it. And each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire, and the lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown in to the lake of fire. Is your name, we sing that song, is your name written there? That's the only thing that's going to matter. Not how much money you made, not how much this you did or that you did. The thing that's going to matter is your name written in the book of life. And we will stand before God and give an account to him. But if we know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we will not end up in the lake of fire. That's the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. That we don't have to worry about that. You know, love covers a multitude of sin. And love is what Jesus had for each and every one of us. That he poured out his life to cover a multitude of my sins and your sins in your life. And if you know that and you believe that in your heart, you're not afraid of judgment. Because if you're in love, it takes away that fear of judgment. If you're in love with Jesus and know that Jesus loved you and he took away the fear and judgment, you don't have to worry about this day. Will we receive rewards? Yes, the Bible says we will. Some will make it in just by the seat of their pants. But what you do here is going to make a difference. Reaching out to people, touching people's lives, being Jesus to somebody else is what's going to make the difference. And then in verse 1 of 21, it says, And then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men. And you know that's where it began. God used to come down and, and walk with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. He used to fellowship with them, be right with them. We have that through the Spirit, the Holy Spirit that lives in us. But the bottom line is, when this happens, we're going to be right with God. Not only right with Him, but we're going to be right with Him. And that's what's going to make the difference. No fear of judgment. Love has no fear of judgment. Your kids know that you're not going to take them out. You might want to take them to the edge, but you wouldn't take them out. Okay? The bottom line is, the reason you discipline them is because you love them. And if you don't, the Bible says you don't love them. Because that's what God wants. And I believe God does that with us each and every day. He strengthened us through the things that we look in His living word and see. 
Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying or pain, for the older order has passed away, and things have passed away, and he who sits seated on the throne says, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down for these words are truth, truth worthy and trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of living water, water of life. And he who overcomes will inherit all this. And I, I will be his God and he will be my son and daughter. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexual immoral, those practicing magic arts and idolers, idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the lake of burning sulfur. And this is the second death. We have hope in Christ Jesus. Even if we don't have a perfect life here on this earth, we have hope in Christ Jesus that one day all things are going to be new. And even in Isaiah, if you'll, if you'll turn to Isaiah, chapter 11. Keep your finger back where we was. Isaiah chapter 11. It talks about this time when Jesus comes to rule on earth. And I believe this is what they're talking about is the millennial, the thousand years reign. But I don't think it's going to change from this point. But the thing of it is, even when we get to the end of judgment and we're with God and he's with us. And this is an amazing thing because, you know, have you ever wanted to just walk up to a little deer and pet it? and then not be afraid of you. You know, the Bible says that, that God put that there so they run from us, whether it's part of the curse or whatever it is. Would you ever like to just pet a bear? Mm -hmm. A lion? Wouldn't that be awesome to have a time when you could wake up and you could go out and there's a lion out laying in your grass and you could walk up to that thing and pet it? Well, here in, it talks about the branch of Jesse, and that's Jesus. And it talks about this in verse 1, all the way through 7 or 9, I believe. It says, A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will be bare fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. His spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes. How many times do we judge by what we see? And it might even be wrong. What we see somebody doing in their actions and it's really not why they're doing it. Because you can be wrong about that. You can foresee, have a bad thing, relationship with somebody and, and everything they do to you is wrong. It doesn't matter what it would be. But God, Jesus isn't going to be like that. He's not going to judge by what he sees or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness will he judge the needy. With righteousness. You, you won't be falsely accused by Jesus. If he ever accused you, it would be because you did it. Because you know why? He knows your heart. 
He knows your heart more than your actions. And what looks like things and, and men and women and brothers and sisters in Christ isn't always what it seems to be. And all of us have been. Have you ever been wrongly accused of something? And you know you did it for the right reasons, but it didn't look like that. It looked wrong. Verse 4, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. We, we read about that. And with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and his faithfulness, the sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. And the cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lay down together, and the lion will eat straw like an ox. And the infant will play near the hole of a cobra. And the young will put his hand into the viper's nest. Wouldn't that be nice not to have to worry about all that? Mm -hmm. When you're raising kids? Wouldn't that be nice? And they will live in, they will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of God's knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Wouldn't that be awesome? He's making all things new. The things that was former, sin, pain, crying, death, all those things won't be anymore. How many times have we prayed for somebody for one of those things not to happen in their lives? For the sick to die. For people to do the right thing. And I've often thought. I just want to be an eagle and soar. And look down and see. That would be so cool. Yesterday I was over to the lake. Harrison Lake. And there was a, it wasn't an eagle. It was a buzzard. But he was. you could tell he was riding the things. And he kept doing the circle. And kept going higher and higher and higher. And I thought to myself, God, what's it like to be there and to see, look down? Things that we would never do and things that we would never believe that would happen, God says all things are going to be new. He's going to prepare a place for you and I. And that place, there's not going to be no more sorrow, no more death, no more crying, no more pain. No more elections. I ought to get an amen for that. Oh. <laughs> but I want us to come back to Revelation chapter 21. And we just read before that about those that won't make it into heaven. Do you know any people like this today? Do you know any people that you're close enough that you could go and share the gospel with them to understand that God has a place new that's going to happen? Judgment is going to fall on this earth one day. And it's going to be judged by fire. And is there anyone that you know that doesn't know Jesus right now? That you could run to and you could tell them. Because things are speeding up. Things are happening fast. They just, they just passed the thing. Part of the treaty with Israel and, and the Arab nations. The, what's the name of the, the AU and whatever. Yeah, thank you. And one thing they said, that they'll be able to go and worship in Jerusalem freely. And you can't do that now. Israel can't do that. 
where the temple sat. It's a beginning. It's a start. Nobody thought it would ever happen. That isn't all the Arab nations. But it's a start to what God wants to do in people's life, and it has to come to pass. And God will cause it to come to pass, no matter what we think. God's in control, and we're not. If this is what God wants, then it'll happen. But the Bible says when they say peace and peace, look out. The end is coming. We'll see. You know, that's the thing about prophecy. That's the thing about nobody really knows. We have our things that we believe. Personally, I believe in the rapture. I believe Lot was taken out. He didn't go through the and didn't die in the wrath. Noah didn't die and his family didn't die in the wrath. They was lifted up above it and was safe. That's why I believe in the rapture. I know some people don't and I'm okay with that. You know, one day we'll know. But how many times, think about this, how many times in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, did Jesus say, how long should I be with you? You're not getting what I'm saying. And I'm sure he says that about me. And you. But people, God is only bringing, you know, I said, why, why, why did God turn him loose after the thousand years again? You know why? Because God is going to have judgment. So that he can start things all fresh and anew. That's why he's doing it. I thank God you got him caught. Don't leave him out of here. You know? But you know what? God knows. And God's going to deal with the Jewish people during this time. So... What we need to really realize, God said he would gather them back, and he's doing it. You can read that in Isaiah. You can read that in, in uh, Ezekiel, that he would gather his people back. And you know what? All the Jewish people are going back. Why? Because God's getting ready to make all things new. Are you ready for that? Can you possibly even think? I closed my eyes and I said, God, I, I, what's that going to look like? What is that going to look like? No more pain. No more sorrow. No more death. No more sin. And then he goes on. And maybe next week we'll get to that. He talks about the new Jerusalem as it comes down. And all the things it's made of. And I can't hardly, I don't even know half of those precious stones that he's talking about. I've never seen them. I remember in Sunday school when I first became a Christian, I was, I don't know, it was 1976. I don't know how old I was. 19 maybe. I, there is hope. I was young once. Okay. <laughs> and I thought about that. God, just come quick. Let's get this over with. I'm ready to go to heaven. But as we talked last week, God is patient. He wants everyone to be saved. You know what the question I have for us today? Do we want everyone saved? Is there anyone you wouldn't share the gospel with? And what holds us up from sharing the gospel? <clears throat> Even sharing about what we just read today. What is keeping us from doing it? And what the testimonies that you have in your own personal life to share them. So that people can see that Jesus is real. I'm trying to hit you hard with this. You talk about 
about new beginnings and a testimony. This morning I woke up and I, not my alarm, I just woke up. First words were authentic beginnings. Amen. Didn't know what that meant. But you're talking about new beginnings. It's going to be the way God wanted it to be in the beginning. But men sinned. They was deceived and thought that they wanted to. And what did the devil say? He said, God just don't want you to be like him and have the knowledge that, you, that he has. The devil wants you to believe a lie. That sin is not sin. It's being, what's the word they use? Tolerant. Watch that word a lot. To have tolerance. You know, I'm glad that I don't have to judge the world. Because just as I read in Isaiah, I would judge by sight. I would judge by what I hear. And I probably wouldn't judge by the heart. But God will. He will judge by the heart. And we're going to stand and give an account of everything that we've done here on this earth. It said the books are going to be open. Even every idle word we say. We're going to have to give an account for that. And I thought about that and I said, God, how can I give an account other than to say it's sin? <laughs> how? We, de we deserve judgment. But God, in his grace and in his mercy, wants to give us life. Life eternal. To a place that we just read about. Where things that aren't happening here will happen there. And it will all be done out of love. There will be no lying. There will be no deception. No sexual immorality. None of those things. If that was right, why wouldn't God have it in heaven? Hello? Look at the trees. They're green. And who are we as men to say that good is evil and evil is good? Someday, we're all going to stand before him and give an account. And he gives us a list of the things that won't be there. We need to wake up America. Because we could lose our freedoms. And it could be everything in that book is a hate crime. They're already talking about that. Then you're going to have to stand up and make a decision who you're going to be with and who you're not going to be with. Amen? Ouch. Do you know Jesus is your personal Savior? He has all this in store for you. We don't want to spend eternity in torment, day after day, night and day torment. And God has a way out. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall, shall not perish but have eternal life. Do you have eternal life? Are you worried about judgment? Perfect love cast out. All judgment. You know, if we know in our hearts that Jesus isn't going to judge us because of what he did, that's perfect love. We're not afraid of him. Did you ever do something? You know, one time, my dad, I don't even know how, I was in grade school, and he was letting me drive his old pickup, and I was driving it back the lane, back and forth, and it had a three on the tree, you guys don't even know what that is. <laughs> and when I went from first, it went in reverse, and it broke something in the transmission. 
I did not want to go tell him. I parked it so it would drive out. <laughs> but then I had to tell him. That's what judgment feels like. Because you you're not, you're not know how it's going to happen or what's going to happen. But you know what? If we know Jesus died for our sins, we don't have to worry about that. We just confess them. Doesn't give you a license to go out and sin. Don't go there with me. What? God judges your heart. He knows. You don't got to worry about me judging you. You got to worry about him. People tell me some things about their life. And I said, you know what? That's between you and God. You need to deal with that. But the bottom line is, perfect love casts out all fear of judgment. Do you have that in your heart? If you do, great. If you don't, you can have it today. You don't have to worry about it anymore. If you ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins, you accept him as your personal Savior. And you start walking with him and following what the word says and doing it, just not hearing it, to do it. And it makes a difference in our lives. Amen? Amen. If you haven't done that, please don't leave here without it. Rich. Um, just so you know how God works. This morning at, this morning at 7 o'clock, I had a call from a daughter and who has turned her life around on fire for God. One of the things that they have praise for with the family, that their children will come to know the Lord in the fullness. And she's, her newfound love for God, she goes to, drives her car to go work, and she's praying in the Spirit of the Lord. And the Spirit of the Lord came over her as she was crying and travailing in the Spirit. And she couldn't understand why this was happening to her on that day when she's driving in the car to work. Well, she found out, and I'm not supposed to tell this, I told Janet that I was not, I was told not to say, but I have to say this because this is, how God, Lord. This is how God works. She got a call from a hospital that her son had literally died of an overdose and was brought back to life. Mm -hmm. Now, that child needs God really bad. And when the pastor sits there and says, his time is not ready because not all have come to know the Lord, that's what he's talking about, about this young man who needs God in his life right now. And thank God his mother is on fire for God, and hopefully between me and her and maybe Janet and others will help to bring that boy to, to the Lord. And this is the reason why Pastor said what he said to me. And lives are messy, people. But we have to get in them. Then your life wasn't messy at all. You didn't have no messes. I had some big ones. <laughs> Ask my wife. But the bottom line is, God can take care of that. And he can make all things new in your life. Amen? That can happen. Because he's going to make everything all brand new. The things that are going on in our world today are just going to be the past. And God has a future that we can't even imagine what it's going to be like. To be in his very presence. I remember when I got saved, I went up and was talking to the pastor and all I could do was cry. I, I couldn't stop crying. And he looked at me and he says, God's got your heart now, don't he? We need that repentance in our country, in our world today. Amen? And we're the ones that can make that difference by sharing our testimonies. I got a bunch of them that God's done. Things that I look over and think, oh God, you saved me from that. And there's some things that I got myself into. That was my fault. But we got to make the difference and know. And we got to humble ourselves before God. Then he'll heal our land. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's stand.
I hope you're encouraged to know that we're not going to have to go through the judgment. We will have to give an account of what we did with the life that God has given us. That God ordained, that God put in our life to make a difference. And just like the little things like Kelly said, she heard those words. Two words. But then God adds it all together. And his spirit is like, that's why I ask if anyone has anything. Because you can be a part of this. I don't have to do it all. But the Holy Spirit wants to use you. Amen? So never underestimate what God can do through you. Because he has a purpose and a plan for your life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the many blessings and how beautiful this world is, Father. We can't imagine what life would be like when a wolf will lay down with the lamb, a bear will feed with a cow. Father, how is that possible? But it's only possible with you. All we know is the old order, Father, the sinful nature, the sinful ways of our lives. And Father, that affects everything in nature. But there's a day coming when you will walk with us and you will talk with us and you will be our God and we will be your children. We are now, Father. But Father, you have something even more marvelous than what we can comprehend with our mind today. And Father, we thank you again for the rain that we've received. We give you the praise, the honor, and glory. And Father, for the blessings, we pray for this young man, Father, that Rich was talking about. Father, that he would come to know you and you would break off the addiction in his life in Jesus' name. And so, Father, bless each one as we leave this place. Guide, lead us to those that need you the most, Father. Father, continue to give us those eye winks, those special times when we know that it's only from you. And we know that you love us and care for us. Now, Father, bless each one. Watch over them and keep them through the week, Father. And even those that are traveling today, be with them, those that aren't here today, Father. Be with the sick, touch them, and heal them in Jesus' name. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Great. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Great two or three people, and you're dismissed.